turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 6. Not actually going to read uh, that passage right now. I'll be sharing some things from Genesis chapter 6 in a short while, but I uh, would like to have you there when the time comes. I had a couple of families here in our church that have experienced death in uh, recent days. The Jowdry family had a funeral this past week. And uh, the Sharp family has a funeral this coming week, actually tomorrow morning, uh, with the passing of uh, Faith Sharp's dad in St. John. That service is tomorrow. So we as a church family are certainly are mindful of uh, these ones, and uh, we certainly want to pray for them as they go through this time. Uh, will you bow with me for prayer? Father, we thank you for the morning that you've given us. Thank you for the privilege just to be a part of your church, uh, Lord. Um, so many different things that fill our lives. We thank you that, uh, Lord, you encompass it all. Uh, you, you encompass our home life, our work life, uh, the things that we do for leisure. Thank you, Lord, that you, you play a part in it all. And we're grateful just to be here as a body this morning. And uh, we look to your word and we pray that you would just give us wisdom as we deal with, uh, Lord, at times some difficult uh, subjects that, that come across our path. And we pray that you would just supply us with your word and your spirit, Lord, at the appropriate times. We do remember these two families today. We pray for uh, the Jowdry family, for Jeremy and his family, and just the passing of his uh, grandfather uh, just a a week or so ago, and uh, certainly for Faith and her family in the loss of her dad. And uh, we pray for them especially. uh, You give them a special measure of grace, uh, certainly tomorrow and in these days. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for the privilege once again, to gather with our family here, and uh, may you just direct us as we, uh, as we explore your word together once again. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was uh, Monday evening of this week that uh, Cheryl and I, along with Seth, decided to, uh, to go see a movie, uh, Spectre, uh, James Bond. 007. I expect that maybe some of you have seen it. As in typical Bond fashion, uh, the movie started out rather uh, fast-paced. A uh, cryptic message leads uh, James Bond to uh, Mexico City, where he ends up in the middle of a festival. It was called the Day of the Dead Festival. Uh, lively, active, uh, things happening. But in the midst of the festival, doesn't he spot the villain, pursues the villain... Uh, follows him into a building, blows the building up, the villain gets away, he follows the villain again, the villain jumps on a helicopter, doesn't bond, commandeer the helicopter, and just before the villain falls out of the helicopter, Bond manages to slip a ring off his finger. Tell you what, why don't you, instead of just me describing it, why don't we just take a quick look at that scene very quick. Wait. Uh, the ring. The ring played a very important part because the, ram, the ring led him to Rome where he met a beautiful a widow of a, an infamous criminal that uncovered a sinister organization known as Spectre. I tell you, it's all, it's all pretty exciting stuff. But you know what? Things aren't, aren't lost on me when, when, when things happen in the course of my day or the course of my life. 
And as much as, you know, you come away from James Bond thinking, wow, that was pretty amazing, I wasn't lost on the fact that just, uh, just three nights earlier on Friday night, the, the events of Paris, in many respects, played out like a James Bond movie, in all honesty. And I thought, how, right, how, right, how ironic that the things of, you know, James Bond and 007, they sort of excite us. And yet the things in Paris, they, they scare us to death. Or we could say the things that happened in Beirut just a few days earlier, or the things that happened in Mali just a, a few days after. And so as I, as I you know, was planning to get ready for this morning, I, I've, been, I've been wanting to do this theme really for, for years, for years. And I guess just what happened this past week just kind of forced forced me into just just want to deal with it this morning and, and ask the simple question, what makes us evil? What makes us evil? What makes people evil? I don't think anybody would argue that the things that took place in Paris uh, a week ago Friday night were were evil. And in all honesty, we could we could we could establish quite a long list this morning, couldn't we? We could establish quite a long list of events that have taken place over recent months or even recent years or through the course of your life. Things that are, that are splashed on the news and the cable channels all day long or things that you read in the news or things that you don't even read in the news. Things that you see that maybe only a few people see. And as you look at these things and you see them play out, you cannot help but say that is just pure evil. That's just pure evil. And so my question this morning is what makes us evil? What makes people evil? Are people people born evil? Or do people become evil? And I wonder if, if if it's possible that even within this group of people that are here this morning, is it possible that any of us could devolve into what we would describe as evil? Those are some questions that I'd like to, to try and answer from Scripture this morning. I do want to say what I don't want to do this morning. I don't want to talk about where did evil come from. And I don't want to talk about why does God allow evil or why does God allow suffering. Those are subjects that, that, I, that we have dealt with in the past about where evil comes from. So I don't want to deal with that this morning. But I do want to ask what makes people evil? What makes people do the things that they have done? Because we are in complete agreement, I think, this morning, that evil exists around us. I ask you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, because we see the first hint of great evil in the Bible in Genesis chapter 6. This is the story of Noah and the things that led up to the flood. I'll begin to read just at verse 1 when it says, When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they married. They married any of them that they chose. And the Lord said, to, said that my spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and they also, afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, and they were heroes of old and men of renown. It says in verse 5, it says that the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made men on earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created, From the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Did you notice the words that God used to describe people of that day? And back in verse 5, look what it says. It says, the Lord saw how great, how great man's wickedness on earth had become. It goes on to say that every Inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. It's quite a description, isn't it? It's quite a description. I don't know if, if God could have painted a darker picture of the condition of man 
than he has in verse 5. Over time, I've heard people uh, suggest that our society has, has spiraled out of control so much that we are much like the days of Noah. Our hearts and our condition is like Noah's people. And, and as much as things are bad today, I'm not inclined to think that. I'm not inclined to think that we are as bad as it was. And I'll explain maybe this morning why, why I feel that way, regardless of how bad things are. But I do want to say this morning that there is a difference in my mind. There is a difference between those that are sinful and those that are evil or those that are wicked. I hope you understand the difference. We're going to explain the difference this morning because we are all sinful. If I asked you to raise your hand this morning, if you're a sinner, I hope every single one of you would put your hand up. And yet that does not mean that we're evil, even though we're sinful. You may remember back in Genesis chapter 6 here, it said that when God looked down at the people, he saw that they had become wicked. That's what it says. It says they became wicked wicked. And that would lead me to believe that in Noah's day, people had not always been wicked. They became wicked. They allowed themselves to become wicked. It wasn't something. They weren't born wicked people. I don't believe anyone is born wicked. And yet they became wicked. Hence my question this morning, how do people become evil? Well, again, I believe that we're all sinners. I believe we're sinners by two, by two reasons. The first reason is this, that we are sinners by birth. We are sinners by birth. The moment that precious little one comes into this world, and we've had a few of them around here lately, by the time that precious little one comes into this world, they are, in fact, nine months sinners. I, probably if I could go back and redo that slide... I probably shouldn't even put the word birth. I should probably put conception, that we are sinners by by conception. You're familiar with maybe the words in uh, Psalm chapter 51. It says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. We, we, we've become sinners from the moment of conception and the moment of birth. Matter of fact, it goes on to say in the New Testament, Paul writing again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, For in all, Adam die. So in Christ, all will be made alive. You see, as a child, as an individual, we had really no say. We had really no say in our sinful condition. We were born into it. Because of Adam's sin, that sin has been passed on to us. Just like the characteristics that you possess today, your physical characteristics and your temperament characteristics, you received... Because of your parents. Some of you, raise your hand if you look like your father. Come on, put your hands up. Come on, admit to it. He won't mind. Raise your hand if you look like, raise your hand if you look like your mother. Good, great. We got some of both of you. Raise your hand if you act like your mother. Oh dear. We got some reluctance there. Raise your hand if you act like your father. Yeah. Everybody has an answer to that question. We all do. But we are the product of our parents. And we are the product of our grandparents. We look like them and we act like them. And we also receive this sinful, this sinful nature. So we, we are sinners by birth. But do you know what? We are also sinners by choice. By choice. Adam and Eve are really the only exception to that. They are the only exception to that. Adam and Eve were not created uh, with sin. They were created sinless. But they became sinners by choice. And who of us here doesn't know the story in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, where Eve entered into that conversation with the serpent. And she took the fruit and she gave the fruit to Adam. And and they both became sinners by choice. If you turn the page to chapter 4, we meet Cain and Abel. Now, Cain and Abel were born sinners. So So they were sinners by birth. But we also know by what happened in Genesis chapter 4 that they became sinners by choice as well. And we're familiar of those verses where Cain lured his brother Abel to the field and there took his life. He became a sinner by choice by what he did. And that certainly applies. It applies to all of us. The very next chapter is chapter 5. And 
Well, we know what happened in chapter 5 and in chapter 6. We know in chapter 6 that that the whole world was wicked. Every thought, every inclination of the thought of man was wicked. And I scratch my head and I say, how did that happen? How did we go from chapter 3 by simply taking a, a forbidden fruit off the tree and eating it to chapter 6 where it says all of mankind, with the exception of Noah and his family, were wicked? How how can things go so wrong so fast? There's actually some science out there that's uh, come about in recent years that suggests that some people uh, carry what is referred to as a killer gene, a killer gene. Dr. James Fallon is a professor at the University of California in Irvine. He's a specialist on, uh, I guess, brain scans is is how I'll refer to him today. He was given a a stack of brain scans of a variety of people. He wasn't told anything about them, and he was simply told to analyze them. And that's what he did. He began analyzing these brain scans. And he, he began noticing some similarities in different ones. And so he'd put a pile here and a pile here and a pile here. There was one certain pile that had some ab- abnormalities in the frontal lobe of the brain. It was just something that was not common. It was something that was rather unusual. And there was a whole group within this stack that were given to him. And it wasn't until he was all done his analysis that he learned that this stack of abnormalities were attributed to all of those that were violent murderers and killers. And so the question is, is there, some, is there something that we're internally wired with that makes people particularly violent or particularly evil? I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. However, we are going to get our parish nurse Anne to set up a thing at the back and have all your brains scanned. Think we could do that next Sunday, Anne? Okay, and we're going to find out who's got abnormal brain scans, okay? To be honest, I don't know. I don't know if we're born with something that's just tweaked wrong in there. I don't know if that's the case. But I do know this. I do know this. What I, what I feed grows... And what I starve dies. I don't really know what goes on in my head. But I do know that what goes on in my life. That what I feed grows. And what I starve dies. It works with plants. It works with pets. And it works with people. That if we feed it, it'll grow. But if we don't feed it, it'll die. We're all sinners. We've already established that. But when, it, but when it comes to that reality that we are all sinners, how can I best describe this? We come to a fork in the road. We're all sinners. And in light of that sin, I can go this way or I can go this way. And it all hinges on what I feed and what I starve. If I choose to... If I choose to feed my spirit and starve my sin, you know which way I'm going to go. But if I choose to starve my spirit and feed my sin, you know which way I'm going to go. I want to talk to you about that for just a second. I want to talk to you about the importance of feeding your spirit. Do you know how to do that, by the way? You know how to feed your stomach, But do you know how to feed your spirit? You feed your spirit by, um, you feed your spirit by coming to church, okay? You do. You feed your spirit by having communion with God, in other words, conversation with God regularly. So you do. You feed your spirit by trying to absorb what God's word says. That's what you do. You, you, you absorb God's word. You feed your spirit by listening to good music. You do. You feed your spirit by, by reading good books. You feed your spirit by, by hanging around with good people, like the people in this section <laughs> and this section, and especially this section, right? That's how you feed your spirit. 
We need, we need to feed our spirits. It says in Philippians chapter 4, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever the things are of a good report, if there's any virtue in any of these things that are praised, where they meditate on these things, that's what we need to do. And yet, there is an importance to feeding your spirit, but you also need to know the dangers of starving, or excuse me, of feeding your sin. Paul describes it in Galatians chapter 5 when he says, For the lust, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and they're contrary to one another, so they do not do the things that you wish. That describes the, the fork in the road. That describes the struggle that we face that we face every single day. Do I do the right thing or I do the wrong thing? Alexander, Alexander Shulchanisen was a Russian a novelist, uh, a very outspoken critic of, of, the, um, of the Soviet Union. This is what Alexander wrote. He says, Gradually it was disclosed to me that the line dividing good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. That's the crossroads. That's the crossroads that we all experience where, am I going to do the right thing or am I going to do the wrong thing? And if I continue to do the wrong thing, if I make the choice of of feeding my sin... My life will spiral, and your life will spiral to some very dark places. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, instead to suit their own desires. We we live in a day when people suit their own desires. That's the time we live in now. And many people have been doing that for so long. Their spirit, the good that's in them, has died long ago. And the evil, the sin that is within them, is living well. John Ortberg tells, tells of the very first time that he went to Africa many years ago. It was Ethiopia, the country that he was in. And he was shocked to see children that were on the sides of the road that had been deliberately maimed by their parents. Their eyes had been gouged out and their limbs had been broken in order that they could be placed by the side of the road with a tin cup and beg. Those children were a tool for, for economic survival for their mom and their dad. Those things don't happen overnight. You just don't wake up some morning and say, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be evil. Those are things that happen over a, a period of time of us continuing to feed our sin and to starve our spirit. Scott Speck is a psychiatrist who lives in the United States, been a psychiatrist all of his life. He speaks of uh, a young man that he was tasked to counsel back early in his career. His name was Bobby. Bobby was 15 years old. And Bobby was suffering from depression and a whole lot of other things. And much of it resulted from the suicide of his brother, his 16-year-old brother. His brother had taken a 22 caliber, 22 caliber rifle and, and killed himself. And now, in the months and years that followed, Bobby just struggled with life. And so, so Scott Peck, the, the, the psychiatrist, was trying to figure out a way out of this darkness for him. And in the course of their, their counseling, he learned of a very disturbing event that took place shortly after his brother killed himself. His parents gave him a gun for Christmas. Scott was just flabbergasted that these parents would do that. And he said, 
what do you mean they gave you a gun? They gave me a 22 caliber rifle. He said, they went out and bought you a, a gun? He said, no. He says, they gave me the gun that my brother killed himself with. In a follow-up meeting with the parents, he, he raised this, he raised this question. And he said, what, what were you thinking? He says, the thing that amazed me the most is that they had no idea that what they did was wrong. They, they deliberately did it thinking that this was a good thing. Jump ahead 20 years, and Scott gets saved. The psychiatrist, the psychologist, excuse me, gets saved. And he writes about that event that had happened some 20 years earlier. He says, one thing has changed in the 20 years. I now know that Bobby's parents were evil. I didn't know it then. I felt they're evil, but I had no vocabulary for it. My supervisors were not able to tell me. Uh, We were scientists. We weren't priests. And we weren't supposed to talk in such terms. Interestingly, though, although I have often worked with convicted criminals and prisoners, I have rarely found evil in them. Evil, he said, is not primarily indicated simply by sinful acts. Rather, it is the refusal to tolerate one's sense of sinfulness. The central defect in evil is not sin, but it is the refusal to acknowledge sin. Do you understand that? That just because you're sinful doesn't mean you're evil. But because you continue to feed your sin and starve your spirit, you get to the point where you do not recognize. I put it, let me put it this way. If I had to describe what makes us evil, this is what makes us evil. It's when we reach a point after feeding our sinful nature and starving our spirit, we are incapable of seeing our wickedness. And when we see terrible things play out in the news and the world around us or even across the street, people have allowed their lives to spiral, spiral out of control. Without question, this is the most depressing sermon that I have ever preached. (laughs) And I can't let you go home that way. Because you know what? Something, something is going to happen out there tomorrow. And if it doesn't happen tomorrow, it's going to happen Tuesday or Wednesday, right? And we're going to be right back into this again. And we're going to shake our heads and we're going to think, why does evil happen and what can we do about it? In southern Mexico, there is a, there's a church that was built back in uh, around the mid-1600s. It's called the... Uh, the Temple of Santiago. It's a beautiful church. It's about 450 years old. But back in the 1700s, I'm told that there was plagues that went through that area of southern Mexico. And not just the church, but the entire communities were abandoned. And this beautiful church, this, this Temple of Santiago was abandoned. Back in the early 1960s, just about 50 years ago, the authorities in Mexico uh, built a dam. And in the process of building a dam, they, they flooded this entire valley where this church is located. And for the last 50 years, this church has been under 100 feet of water. It's been completely disappeared off the place of, face of the earth from the human eye. But this year, this past summer and this fall, a drought has been taking place in southern Mexico. And this once uh, filled reservoir, which looked like this mammoth lake, has been slowly, day by day, week by week, month by month, going down and going down and going down. And and as bad as the conditions were getting on the outside, the church began to emerge 
from the earth. I've got some pictures of it. It's really a neat, it's really a neat place. And, and, and as bad as things got on the outside, as, as, as the drought and the famine on the outside got worse and worse and worse, the church grew taller and taller and taller. The analogy is for us. That, that this week, if it's not as bad as last week, it'll be close to it, right? This, this world is not going to get any better. Scripture tells us that in the last days, perilous times shall happen. But we're also told that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we have an opportunity in these days to emerge. What can we do? I've got three things I want to leave you really quickly and we're done. Three things really quickly. When you see something happen in the world that just breaks your heart, whether it be evil or suffering, here's the three things I want you to do. Number one, find a face, say a prayer, and repeat regularly. First thing you need to do is find a face. If you're home today and and pictures of Paris come on the, the TV screen, or pictures of Mali or wherever it is, find a face in the crowd. And try and memorize that face. Because if not, it's just a crowd of people. It's a crowd of foreigners that we quickly forget. But if you can somehow find a face and just burn that face into your mind, pray for them. Pray pray for their suffering and pray for the evil that is around them. Pray for them. Don't don't say you're going to pray for them tomorrow. Whenever you see something on the television or read it in the paper or hear it on the radio, stop right now and pray for them. Don't put it off till tonight or don't put it off till tomorrow. Do it right now. You don't have to pull your car off to the side of the road and find a parking spot or you don't even have to leave your desk. Or leave whatever you're doing. Just pray right there for that face that you've seen. Repeat that every time you think of them. Don't don't you wish you could just reach into this world and just turn things around? Well, we can't. But little by little, we can just emerge from the drought around us and be God's representatives in this world. Let's pray. Father, we we wish this wasn't the case. We wish we didn't have to talk about evil things. We wish that we didn't have to see the things that are happening around the world. And yet, Lord, this is the world that we live in, and it's all because of sin. It's all because of Adam and Eve's sin. Lord, it's because of our sin. And yet, Lord, we thank you that By feeding our spirit, we can hold our sin in check. Lord, we'll never be perfect as long as we live in this world, but we can hold our sin in check, Lord, when we feed our spirit. And I pray, Lord, that even though there be no violent killers amongst us today, I pray, Lord, that we would always recognize the importance of each and every day feeding what needs to be fed, and, Lord, starving what needs to be starved. Thank you that, Lord, greater are you in us than he that is in the world. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.